Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today we're joined by Michael Carter, aka Bitsby Trippin. Michael walks us through how to mine during a bear market, including strategies for shoring up your portfolio and also when to turn off the lights and turning them back on again. Michael, welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited for this conversation. I think a lot of our customers and a lot of people out there who are just interested in mining are going to be keen on hearing your words of wisdom of mining during a bear market. Of course, we'll get into some content creation stuff, I'm sure, here and there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's good to be back, man. Thanks for, uh, you know, shooting a message over and asking uh, about coming on. And, you know, I know uh, you probably saw a couple of tweets out there. Um, usually when there's a pullback of any sort like this, you know, people start kind of like, okay, what's going on? Maybe it's their first time uh, with the volatility that happens in this space. Uh, And for a multitude of reasons, it actually doesn't matter. And this is one of the things I was telling people, like it doesn't matter why it's pulled back. Sometimes it's like, it's always happened. And it, sometimes it's because, you know, China's banning something or somebody says it's going to ban something or, um, you know, like in this particular instance, I think there is some correlation to some of the Terra stuff that went on, right? At the end of the day, it's a, it's been a cycle that's now happened four times. Um, and nothing in, in, in that cycle, the way I use it for just, uh, I would say a confidence variable for me is did anything fundamentally change in the architecture of the code and anything that made the original value propositions on the FOMO side happen, did any of that change? And the answer is no. Like the the same rationale is there, the same understanding from a, a being a permissionless decentralized system. From when we're talking Bitcoin, when we look at the innovation, love it or hate it on the NFT side or the DeFi or any of the DeFi degens and all the stuff that's going on from the development side. On the other, I'd say, kind of side of the fence on the cryptocurrency side, it's still happening. People are developing things, um, you know, with with good intentions. Most of those folks that you see a lot of this stuff are trying to change something. They're trying to answer the mail on something. And then, of course, you're always going to have the negative, you know, um, uh, folks that one might not have experience and just try something. And they, they unfortunately are trying in production, as I would call it. And people buy into it and then it fails, something like a Terra thing, or you have just straight up malicious actors that are always going to be part of the game theory in there in a decentralized system where people are going to try to take from others, right? I think you're going to have all of those kind of factors, but none of the core uh, setup changed, right? So when I see a drawback like that, what I tell people is like, you know, you hear this expression a lot. It is, and it's, you hear it a lot because it's happened a few times and people zoom out and look at those cycles, right. And understand that, Hey, this is part of the cycle. Uh, when you're doing anything with cryptocurrency in general, especially if you're doing on the investing side or you're looking to invest in the space in general from an infrastructure or something like that. Um, the calculus shifts on you, but maybe, maybe it works out in a way, uh, for you, uh, to enter the space now because it is cheaper. Um, and have confidence that those core values didn't change. Right. Um, I, I look at it different. It's been, you know, four cycles for me. Uh, and, uh, we've documented that process on the channel a lot. And the part of that is that understanding with even more confidence in this cycle than the other cycles, right. Is that there is a massive amount of people entering the space that want to be part of it. And it isn't necessarily for the, Hey, I'm going to the moon thing. It is literally because they're making fundamental change on the way we look at finance and fintech. Um, and the options that are out there. Um, and we're seeing more and more now there. Lightning's made a lot of progress. You have Strike, you have all these other apps, you have governments in other countries making institutional changes. You know, Panama, I know, just did some stuff uh, with making no capital gains on Bitcoin. So you have, you know, El Salvador, you have all these things in this cycle that's occurred that's now moved the needle further. And what I would say is look at these changes and understand while Maybe they're not in a large market country yet. They're institutional and changing the fundamentals, right? Of like what's going on there. And all we're going to see is this cycle happen again, where people start to understand why they gravitate back to it. And then you'll start to have that run up again. And now you're going to have more adding on to the crypto space. And that's what I would say from a very top level is understand it comes in cycles and understand that the fundamentals really haven't changed. So there's a few different places we could take the conversation here. We normally don't do price talk, but 
would stay there for a second. It's been trending downward since November. $69,000 was a high. It's been pretty choppy since uh, the Terra Luna thing the other day definitely took Bitcoin down quite a bit. That might be the most notable down spike of the last six months or so. I mean, there's definitely some other other moments, right, where we saw some, I don't know what you want to call them, like flash spikes down, but uh, Terra Luna day, was that like a Tuesday or something? I yeah, it was like midweek. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know because I, I was getting pretty much lit up from yeah. everybody like, hey, what's going on? I had some uh, uh, acquaintances and stuff that were in Luna and they were, you know, obviously trying to f- understand what was going on. There was a lot of confusion uh, of why it was going as fast as it was. And they're like, is this what a, I mean, literally, I have a text that was like, is this what a rug pull is? <laughs> you know, they had no idea, right, what was going on. I'm like, no, I don't think it's that. I think there's something else going on a little more very fast macro level thing that's going on yeah. with the with the coin and them trying to adjust for the peg um but i i honestly didn't really track too much of what was going on um in terra at before that right i was i saw the experiment i saw the the risk when you're trying to algorithmically do it and this is part of the the game theory that's out there that you know if somebody took a large enough a hedge against it you could create this you could create an event it was just is it too big to fail kind of concept um and i think that there were people on that side of the fence that were thinking that you know eighty thousand bitcoin was enough size to not have it disrupt it was like a poison pill uh, i think it's been obviously proven that that was not the case um and i would call i would cautionarily tell that anybody that tries to build something like that based without those you know the core fundamentals and you're basing it on just the rest of crypto and that it's yeah. it's probably from the beginning it's it's on a, you know a stilt or a glass house right so it's like there's a lot of things and a lot of other um not even just a straight malicious try to take it out but just other ebb and flow of effects maybe downturns like we have every every two years within the you know the four years of the the Mm -hmm. halvings like every half year we always have like a downturn like you're really playing a volatile potential asset to be your stilt (laughs) you know and like natural pull down could have affected it and destabilized it maybe not from 99 to you know from a dollar all the way to zero but maybe it depegged it and they couldn't react enough, but then they kind of had it at like 50 cents. Right. Or, yeah. you know, and then, like, I think that was part of what the concern was early when I looked at it back in February and, uh, early February, beginning of March, um, when people were just following it and seeing it go up and I was just, you know, was like, yeah, no, it's not really for me. I was trying to find all the different arguments on it. Um, but, uh, you know, I like things that are a little more tangential. I can, touch and feel them. That's why proof of work has always allured me back um, yeah. because I have a little more um, engagement with the network in a way that, you know, I can participate and I know that I, I know the business rules. I know what's going on yeah. with that machine is doing something and I get in recipient of that, of that effort. Now I take a hedge risk on difficulty going up a lot. I take a hedge yeah. risk on price coming down and not making that piece of equipment not generate enough yield if on a USD value to cover for its power, but I, there's a calculus involved there. And I, I think it, that is the only thing that matters at the end of the day for that, right? I don't have to now worry about too much more um, unless those fundamentals change or public sediment in general for the entire crypto space worldwide changes, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's really what it is. People are like, well, no laws can be made and that could sack the whole earth. And I'm like, laws have been made in multiple mm-hmm. countries to the point of the worst existential law of saying it's completely banned. You know, I know we've had it in India. We've had it in, in China, large, huge pieces of this planet, like banning it in every way possible, cutting and rolling pins over, uh, you know, S19 or S9s. Remember we've seen that a couple of yeah. times, like, and it didn't affect it. Right. And so I know that no one country, it's those, those core values of what makes Bitcoin, Bitcoin, um, you know, no single point of failure, right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, everybody has a replicant of the the node that runs a node. Um, and I can, you know, it's that, you know, entire ethos around it that, that keeps its, its structure. So I have, I look at that as like, as long as that doesn't change and somebody's made an effect to that, Mm-hmm. I think we're, we have a good solid base. And then now I'm looking at variables that now have ebb and flows 
that are pretty uh, centrical in their cycles to where I can say, well, I know there's going to be a drawdown. So what do I have to do? What are the things I can control? I can control what I will pay for power because I can go other places. And that's been kind of, we can get into that a little bit as we're trying to scale up our own operations of trying to find the lowest common price that we can to compete. And then I can also control, you know, about turning things off if I need to, or take down half the farm if I need to from a hedged potential in a worst, worst case scenario, you know, like, so I like things that we can control and we can hedge against. And I think that's the easiest and most simplest for people um, that they always come back to it. It's like, I got burned in crypto because I yellowed into some NFTs that got whatever, but then they come back and be like, well, I'm still attracted to it. Well, you're attracted to it yeah. because it's permissionless. Yeah. Um, it's kind of just there, you know about it. It's un, it's not, you can't forget about it. <laughs> it's there yeah. and you'll hear more and more d- d- development yeah. and innovation on it. So, yeah, I mean, that's, um, you know, the, yeah. the strength I think of that network. Yeah, definitely. And we can get into that more. I want to start off with your, uh, your point from earlier, you've been through four cycles now. So mm-hmm. I'd be curious to get like maybe the emotions that the first cycle were like for you. Maybe a lot of people who are listening to this podcast or new to Bitcoin mm-hmm. mining are feeling very similar to your emotions during that time. But what was it like? I'm assuming this is the 2013 bear market or you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 20. So I would say, I guess it'd be fifth because so I was there uh, when I started mining Bitcoin, I really wasn't even paying it for, attention to price as much because uh it was late 2010 early 2011 it was a matter of just get trying to get the coins um and i was it, when i first discovered it it was more like because uh, i was doing a lot of folding at home and folding at home had a leaderboard um and it was more about the concept of just getting and earning uh, uh winning a block of tokens it was the game theory almost right so it wasn't even the fact that i could exchange them for anything at least in the late 2010, early 2011. And then as we were able to put different types of hardware, because mind you, it was like CPU, it was just moving. I found it the moment it was the first few uh, uh, GPU uh, outputs were made. So there was a, a CG miner, um, uh, there was a SG miner, there was a couple old school miners that had got released and I got th- that brought in GPUs. So then it was a matter of like, Hey, what's this hardware do? It wasn't even about the money. It, well, honestly, it wasn't, it was the I- idea of like just getting tokens and that you could exchange them, but they may have value at one day. I-, I remember, uh, looking at price the very first time it was on my birthday. It was, uh, November, f- my ber- birthday is number 15th of 77. So November 14th, I was looking at my, like, maybe I'll, maybe I can buy some more because I'm only earning so many. Mind you, that was like 50 coin blocks. But I was like, I want to like a lot. Like, how can I get more of these tokens? And can you buy them anywhere? There was no marketplace. On November 14th, an OTC, I saw OTC trades on BTC Talk and they were going for about $2.50 a token, right? So they give you an idea, like a thousand tokens was, you know, about 2,500 bucks, a thousand Bitcoin. So it was like, that was my first concept of like trying to attach a price to it. Um, And then we had a run up up to uh, uh through 2012 is right like february of 2012 is when price really got a spotlight on it right it had ran up we had done the halving it ha- it went up to uh 212 dollars uh in february i think cnbc and people started covering bitcoin and that's when it was like it went from like 2 to 11 in, in december and from a, december it went up to 200 dollars it was like wow this is like a lot and when it pulled back down um, so like fifty, eighty dollars, and then it sat at a hundred for a little bit. That was the kind of the first like, oh my god, anybody that just bought it at two hundred just lost half, their, more than half their money. And is this thing a fell right? And now I think that was the first those articles in like two thousand twelve with the first like this just killed Bitcoin. Like it's it's dead. Fifty dollars It used to be two hundred. Um, and that was like that first kind of emotion like. Because I remember that's uh, I made a Mount Gox account had bought on Mount Gox then. And I was like, I, you know, this was a bad idea. Like maybe I shouldn't have done that. Right. And I was in where most people I think now are, if it was was their first time buying in this last run up where I think there's an emotional thing where you start second guessing everything because you don't understand enough about the network yet because you just haven't had enough time to understand and explore the basic, not even the basic, the concepts of this whole premise of what Bitcoin is. And then there's a lot of other tokens there that try to take some of that attention and say, hey, we're better because we do these things. Um, 
and you're just more kind of in it of like a like a token casino almost of like i'm just gonna pick these few and hope they win type of thing like you're betting on horses in vegas type of thing but like uh, when you start to really realize that functionally it's able to do things quicker faster um and with that and what i mean by that isn't everybody takes it right to the the transaction time between two points and i look at it from if if i'm dealing with any large amount of money of any sort like a couple thousand dollars uh, to to send to somebody or i need to get it to somewhere like i could do it through cash app and some of these other things that weren't available back then and that time it was just that was unheard of like to do that kind of movement of, of you know transactions a couple thousand dollars send in bitcoin um now you can do lots much larger transactions with that i mean with you would need tens of thousands of bitcoins right like there's the 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 size of bitcoin has gotten to such a value that now you can have huge transactions right uh that are that you don't need as many as bitcoins to do with it um I, you know i think that everybody comes back to it because you realize that this is functionally different um but yeah i think that the motion wise you get into a place that um that you you have some doubts and you because you're you're stuck in that kind of concept of you know it's just another feature like a cash app is it going to go away um and i think what gives me solace on the network is the fact that i know that's just not going to go away i know one country can't knock it down um and that there's a lot of there's a lot of confidence in that that that, that builds and understands that eventually you'll figure it out it'll be in another cycle and then you'll hear you'll see a lot of other stuff be built um and yeah i think that's what it comes down to and then like the 2013 2014 phase um again remember it it, it went from 100 to like 300 it had a brief period to a thousand you know twelve hundred dollars before the mount gox crash um but you know that november th these are always windows right think of like every time you see the peaks they're literally like a month and a half window right it's like it goes crazy and then it's right back down. <clears throat> and then those are those upper peaks. It rarely sets short of this last cycle where it sat at 50 for like more than a couple of weeks. Um, and then it kind of drew to 40 and then it went back up to, you remember it went all the way down after China thing, it went to 63 and then it went back down to like uh, 29 and then it went right back up to 69, like a few months later. And then it sat at 50 and then it kind of has done its thing to where now it's been holding 30 for as long as it has. Um, it has these like crazy peaks where it just goes parabolic. Um, and you know, I, I think that that emotional roller coaster that comes with it is what creates all that stress um, because people buy the FOMO. Um, but like if you've been in it for a while and you continue to do that dollar cost average, I think it'll get, start to give you more confidence over time as you start to see that your cost, um, you know, uh, the amount of cost that you put into it kind of, tear out a little um because you're buying it a little lower and you're costing your average to come down some so then when it peaks back up to that you, you'll get uh, you know from out of underwater if you were buying it at 63 and 65 and 67 you're like it's going to the moon and you just keep buying and then when it starts collapsing you may buy it a couple more times and then you freak out and now it's at 30 and you're like oh my god it's worth half of what i spent into it or if you keep that kind of any kind of residual incomes that you have you're you're buying it now it, it starts to average that out and it saves you uh i think a lot of stress when it starts to make that move back up again um and you know you know nobody has a crystal ball but i what i would say is i have i've let's put it this way i put a lot of my time and mind you like we were laughing about this uh the other day you know being in this space since 2010 well i would say realistically 2011 like i discovered in 20 2010 on a machine a single machine i expanded that in 2011 into multiple machines and started trying to figure it out and then by 2013 i'd made a youtube channel on it right so it's like the, the all of that time the one thing i've learned is the the consistency at least in the fact that what it does and what cryptocurrencies bring and what it's made it's delivered on many promises of what it said it was going to do it's it, we're at 12 years um and it's um it, it's built an entire industry like it's not going away there's this massive energy i mean there's people that have worked in this space now for eight plus years right like like in a 
like operations, like they've had, you know, I was looking at a couple of resumes. We were looking at a few things for our, our big site build out. And it was like, some of these people's experience have more in this than like their previous experience. Right. And I look at my own experiences of being in the enterprise and like a third of my entire career is crypto, right? It's crazy. Right. So it's like, this is an industry. It's not going away and people understand fundamentally they're building on top of it. So I would say from all of these words that I'm saying is have confidence in what that foundation is and understand that there are lots of people building during these bear markets. And then that's the fruit of that labor that gets seen as things start to get deployed on that run up. Because if you look at this last run up, think of what happened on this last run up compared to the previous, there's one back in 2017, the run up, what happened in November and December, everything was froze up. I don't even know how the price got to where it was because nobody could join a network. Nobody could, meaning nobody could join a financial institution to put money into it. Coinbase went down. Binance was just starting. Uh, Bittrex froze up. Poloniex didn't work. Uh, Kraken died. Like everything was broke on that 2017 run up, right? And everybody, because remember the jokes were, well, Charlie Lee got out at 300 bucks, right? <laughs> on LTC. Well, he worked at Coinbase. Of course he got out, right? So like, like nobody could do anything. Like that run up was up and then it was down. And I remember having that conversation at North American Bitcoin Conference in 2018, right? Cause that was in January. And I remember having that conversation. Everybody's like, Hey, how would you think about that peak? You don't think we're going to hit it again? I was like, I don't know. How did you guys even get in or do anything to lose? Like you couldn't even get logged into anything. Everything was froze up from that run up to look at what we just did where it was easy. Like things, Robin hood and Coinbase always seems to go down in an opportune times. So, I mean, it's kind of the rolling joke with Coinbase. Right. But like, like there were several services that were there. We had Robinhood, we had uh, Webull, we had all the different exchanges. Um, you know, they had a little more rules on them, right? We couldn't go, you had to go to Binance US if you were in the USA, uh, you, you know, uh, BitMEX, there's all these different entities out there that, that were liquidity centers where you could get in if you're a retail coming in. And then you had a lot more other expanded services on the DeFi side that wasn't there either. So then if you were earning tokens, you could convert them using, you know, Ave, Curve, all these other features and functions to really drive up the price from a from a supply grab standpoint, right? Uh, so that was already an order of magnitude innovation on top of the crypto network. What do you think is happening right now? Everybody and everyone has seen that growth and then s tested the machine. And now you're having that amplified because now you have data on what happened there. And people are like, okay... Let's learn from those experiences and then let's build it better. And you're seeing that expansion happening right now. So those are the companies that are funded that are and, and or raising that are building out new networks, new adapters, uh, secondary layer stuff, all of that kind of stuff. So then on this next run up, it's going to be, there's going to be another level of confidence and an ability to maybe law clarity, um, you have fidel, fidel, uh, what, Fidelity uh, Financial Services now allowing people to come right out of their 401k straight into Bitcoin. That may go into market basket stuff too, right? You have all of these other institutional clients now, I think on this next curve that are building to then per support it on the upswing on the other side, right? So there, it, I look at it always from an infrastructure standpoint, mainly because of the crypto mining side of it. But like, I look at it also from a development infrastructure being my other hat in this world is doing large development projects. So it's like, I know the development's happening and that's why I was very critical this week to Ethereum. I don't know if you saw that tweet out to Tim Binko and the Ethereum team that kind of started a little storm in our last video, got like 10,000 views pretty quickly because it was like calling them out on it. And it wasn't to call out the Ethereum development team, but it was the same kind of thing. There's certain behaviors when you talk about integration testing and stuff, I'm being critical of them to make sure that they don't mess up a $400 billion network. Um, and I'm not seeing certain things I would like to have seen like OpenSea saying, yeah, we've tested, we're good. Uh, I'd like to see, um, uh, you know, Curve. I'd like to see DAO Maker, Art Maker DAO come out and say, yeah, man, we've tested it, we're good. I haven't seen any of that. It's like, bro, I got money in there. Like, I don't want that to go like South. Like, like don't, uh, there's, a, it's not, uh, it doesn't have the existential risk like Terra did. However, 
it does have risk and it does have liquidity pools. And if you have a run on the bank on one side, you're going to liquidate, you're going to kill the other side, right? So like there's mechanical things that happen. So like, I want to make sure if confidence goes down because something freezes up an acetation on their network. And even though the consensus layer should have nothing to do with the state layer of the, you know, the uh, main chain, um, uh, it still stops blocks being produced because they can't get the right consensus. So then everybody brings down everything else. Like they're missing the point. They're on the engineering technical side thinking, well, no, it doesn't even, it doesn't interact with that. It's like, it's the consensus layer that ensures that block production on beacon still work. So if something happens there, you're going to break the whole thing. So like I need to make sure that if something they're doing on the smart contract side, doesn't create some kind of weird thing that then breaks your ability to produce blocks like you, you should integrate tests. Like this is not a, this is not a devoid concept. Um, but like, that's just the software hat on me. So anyways, I, that's, that's why I'm, I'm passionate in the space to make sure that people are doing the right due diligence, considering the amount of money that's in this network and that they just do their homework on it and do it right. Uh, and that's all you can do. You can't, you can't protect against everything. We've seen many networks have issues, but I would say if you take everything I just said, cause I said a lot, it was like a word soup um, and understand that, all of that stuff is mechanical pieces that are driving this entire industry. The fact that we're in a dip right now has a lot of macro and institutional uh, things that are happening. And some people may be attacking like a Luna Terra thing and it's caused some pull down and drawdown. But I would say, look what happened after that drew down. It went all the way to 25 K and it bounced right back up to 30. Um, and it's been holding that 30 ahead of that for a while. So we took a massive $40 billion in theory. In reality, it's probably a couple, you know, two, three billion dollars of actual look, liquid cash that got moved uh, in the system hit to Bitcoin, 80,000 Bitcoin being liquidated, some of it on spot, and it absorbed it and bounced back. Um, I think that gives you more than any enough confidence that this industry is not going anywhere. Um, and yeah, I'll let my word soup stop for a minute because that's going to be fun to. <laughs> it's a lot edit. of digest, but it's good stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's really good stuff. That's what you get just... from me, my dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, anyone who's uh, seen you on the, on the live stream is, is familiar with it, but that's why you get all the yes. views, right? It's uh, it's uh, good stuff. So staying with the same line of conversation, uh, we talked about the emotional elements of bear markets. Can you speak a little bit to the mining side of it, right? A lot of people, they buy mm -hmm. a token. That might be the first time they get into it. And uh, they see like, the price of whatever token they buy go down 50%, 60%, some cases 90%. Hopefully you're not mm. down all the way down there. Mining is a little bit different though, right? Because you're buying physical piece of hardware. Mm. Maybe you bought some infrastructure for it as well. You have a PPA that you have to pay for. And now your cash flows have dropped substantially. The cash price is below 15 cents now for a Bitcoin ASIC yeah. and for, for most machines. <laughs> uh, for most like higher efficiency machines, I should say. That's a rough spot to be for a miner. And we've seen in past cycles, miners have a hard time, right? Because miners mm -hmm. typically are almost like a high beta play where they do really well when Bitcoin's doing well, but they do really bad when Bitcoin's doing bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people lose faith. So from your mining perspective, would be interested to get some words of wisdom. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, it's very situational to uh, a couple figures if you're doing it personally, cause it has to do a lot with your ops cost on, uh, your power cost. Um, so you have your sunk cost and your cap X being your minor. Uh, and if we're talking Bitcoin and, and if you're paying, you know, you know, 13 cents right now for your power, it's essentially flat. I mean, you're not making hardly anything. You're, you're, you're making yield, you're making Satoshi's, um, but in summer months, it's hard because it's, it's also, you know, it's situational where, where it's in the winter. You can justify because you're like, I don't have to turn on my heat. I'm getting heat from my ASIC. I got a duct in here. It's great. So what that I'm only making even or even paying maybe because you're just yield, earning yield and you're looking at that at a later time, it may be worth more. So even though you're only making $15 a day, $16 a day on that thing, and it's costing you maybe nine fifty to $12 a day in power, um, you're getting heat out of it. If it's in the summer and now you're also having to cool it or it's just inconvenient, um, it, 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 it makes you have a decision point. If you're a local home miner, you may or may not turn that miner off um, for that time being um, because it's just not worth it, that particular expense. If you have 
a situation where you're like hosting it somewhere and your relative power cost is cheaper and you have hosting fees, essentially it's just, you're, you're staying even, at least you're still getting your stats, uh, on it, or you may come into the negative a little bit in, uh, in 20, what I would say is that those cycles don't tend to last super long. We did have a pretty long bear market in, in the last one where we went from essentially 2018 through mid 2020 as two and a half years. It was a very long bear market. Um, and you still had a ramp up on these various networks. Bitcoin still grew during that bear market. And that's what made it more bear for people. This is why getting your power costs is hugely important um, down to where it's cheaper. Um, and then you also had a huge kind of run up. You had uh, in that with like Ethereum and uh, the alternative mining stuff, like you had the Ethereum mine, uh, developers also reduce the emission. So you, you, it was a kind of a double edged sword here where you're, you're, that that cut you both ways <laughs> like like you were getting less and less anyways because the network was growing the price was roughly flat or to down and they ha- they they reduced the emission unscheduled twice right so uh you went from five to three or five to four right at the peak and then it started dropping and then you went from four to three uh during that time or no you went from four to two and you have uh like no uh like it was, uh, you know, it really hurt like in March of 2020, it went out to 86 bucks and it was at like 300. Right. So like a, a majority, you look at the network and the network started to peel hash rate at that time. It was, it was at a peak of 300 tear hash it went all the way down to like 147. Right. So it halved the, the hash rate. So you saw what miners did. Miners turned off. Uh, it's different with something like Ethereum. I'll split the two networks because it is minor um, thing. With like Ethereum miners, especially uh, most, there's only a few institutional Ethereum miners. The majority of ETH miners are maybe bigger shops that have like five to 10 giga hash uh, because it gets, it's, it's a lot more task intensive. If you're going to try to do hundreds of giga hash, you need a lot of staff. It's just miners have problems uh, on the ETH side. On the Bitcoin side, you can grow to a huge scale, like warehouse, like, uh, you know, Argo, or you look at, uh, um, you know, course scientifica or you look at any of these large super shops um can can really scale to a really big you know multiple petahash in size exo hash almost a full exo hash um like it's well thousands or you know 500 petahash um a lot easier to maintain so the like if you're the home miner version of that, like when you have two or three, like again, like you got the sunk cost in the hardware, you might have to power down if it doesn't make sense for a, a month or two. And all of our time, we, I've had two times that we've had a quote unquote shutdown. Our farm up in Wisconsin, I, I talk on this on the channel a lot, uh, when it's full tilt, 56 giga hash going and we have almost uh, 100 A6 now up there. Um, when we had 54 A6 and then uh, almost 60 giga hash, we've had to take some down because we're out of power. Um, the We were about 23,000 a month in power cost, right? So that's something that if you're not and my goal was never to sell 100%. makes no sense, right? So that means I'm covering something out of pocket uh, for to hold the yield that we want. So when we come close to zero, um, I'm paying essentially more into it. I'm, I'm adding more into the power cost for I can hold the yield. And so I'm looking at it from an expense standpoint that I'm buying cheaper Bitcoin right now. I'm buying cheaper Ethereum as that were because I already have a sunk cost asset earning me some of it, right? Versus just going out and buying the token, right? Because I already have the asset. So I'm, I'm just buying a little cheaper because I'm earning yield. Um, and you can look at it in that way. How much more is it costing you? If, you, if you're paying an extra $50 a month in power because you're negative, I would pay 150 on your power, just pay your power and then just hold your yield, right? Um, you got it. It's really personal when you manage it, but like the whole concept of that thing is that you got to be holding some of that yield. Uh, so you might be just paying for a little cheaper Bitcoin at that time, or it makes sense sometimes with smaller shops just to shut it off and then just buy the Bitcoin. What the, the key point here is, is that you don't want to, I've always done it personally to where if we've shut down the farm when we did in March of 2020, uh, we just shut it off and we, we treat it as a, a maintenance event, right? We shut down in 2020, you had $86, uh, ETH price. You had $3,000 Bitcoin price. Didn't make a lot of sense to run anything right that moment for us personally in our situation at our power cost. So we shut it down, 
but we still use some of that extra money that we were going to invest into the, the, the place and we just bought crypto and then we just used our time for the maintenance of it. Right. So I think what it is, is you got to get your place in a you know, mine in a place that, that makes sense financially for you and understand if you're, if you have a plan that you were trying to earn a certain amount of yield or you're trying to earn a certain amount of Bitcoin over a period of time. Cause remember when you're, when you're building a farm, you're looking at what's this unit going to give me, what's the output of this thing. And some people look just straight at the USD. I've uh, in the origination of mining, like I said before, it was all about the yield. There was a point at some point when it started going up in value because it's very tangible and I can use money at that time only. I, I couldn't use Bitcoin for things. It was like, wow, this thing might actually earn me a lot of money. And that was why I bought like a raspberry jalapeno. I'm pointing to something you guys can't see because I zoomed in. But like there's a little box it, here is doing ETC. We're going to do a, a review on it in a little bit. But like like the jalapeno is a little eight giga hash box um, that was like 300 bucks in like 2012. And I think I got it in uh, like March of 2013. It was so I bought it in like November of 2012 came out in 2013 and it would earn every day 0.3 almost 0.3 of a bitcoin right mind blowing and at that time i was oh no sorry (laughs) 0.03 it would earn 0.33 a month which was seemed like it wasn't that much but 0.33 a month at that time was a couple hundred bucks and i was like hey the roi on this thing if i can get it 0.3 uh is a pretty good return now the reality of it was is it ran for uh, it was, you know, uh, I want to say it was maybe 150 watts, 200 watts. Um, it more than paid for the power at that time, which was rare because we were using very expensive GPUs and uh, a lot of power, 1,000, 1,200 watt power and not earning that much. Um, you know, a, a rig back then, to give you an idea, was about 300 kilohash per card. And if you had uh, at that time, there weren't really six card rigs, it just motherboards weren't made for six cards then. I'd usually have two, like in like the crossfire cards, or I'd have three. I think I had one rig that was a three card. Uh, it was a, uh, I, I had built a crazy rig. It was a 7970, or no, a 6970s. I had three of them on one machine. And that was roughly right underneath one giga hash, right? So this machine was eight giga hash for 150 watts. So it was a huge difference, right? ASIC to uh, the machines. But that those three cards would earn 0.09. Bitcoin a, a, a month. So, uh, like it would take you 10 months to essentially earn one Bitcoin in that machine, a little over 10 months, 11 months uh, of the graphics card machine. And we saw the hash, uh, the difficulty going up to the moon. Anyways, we knew that it was going to go to these, these ASICs, but that was where I kind of looked at, like, maybe it makes sense. Maybe I, I maybe buy some coins. Cause I was looking at trying to sustain this yield. I had a goal, a yield goal. And that's why I say is like, if you're looking at the charts and you, you bought a machine because it was going to earn you a certain amount of money over time, then do the calculus of that and say, how, what do I have to put in to manage my original expectations? So you already bought the machine. You got a sunk cost. I understand you want to run it, but keep with your yield goals. And then when Bitcoin starts to come back, you're going to be able to turn that machine back on because it's always outruns. It always, it has its dip where it hurts miners, but it always front runs back up. And when it has every time, like, think about it, this last run up, people were turning on like, like spun dually text from 2014, right? A five giga hash machine that used like 2,300 Watts or no five tera hash machine, sorry, five tera hash, which was like one, like 20% of an S nine at 45% more power than an S nine. They were turning those on. Right, I, I, like sixty nine thousand dollars Bitcoin. It made that still profitable. To give you an idea, I actually have an SP thirty five sitting around, um, and I did not turn it on. But uh, like, uh, <laughs> I, I was running out of power. So, but that just gives you an idea of like your 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 asset eventually will be able to start stir, still earn yield, but don't lose the passion and the idea of what you were trying to do on making up that difference in SAT. Um, you know, mm-hmm. purchasing. Um, yeah. So if it was fifteen dollars a day right now generation and you're buying an extra $15 a day, then buy $15 a day and your auto buy, um, you know, through uphold or whoever else that you use, um, and try to get it. Now you're gonna pay yeah. fees and I know that sucks. Um, but it, maybe you do one purchase, not $15 every day. Right. I mean, just yeah. do it one time for you only pay one fee, but, um, 
Yeah, that's what I would say. As I, that's the way we do it. I mean, I, I look at it. I've always looked at it that way of just it's about stack and sats and yield. Um, and then it's also being a participant on the network side, um, you know, and you don't have to run everything. It's the same way I always tell people like switching networks from from like Ethereum to like Ravencoin uh, mm-hmm. and, and that are upset that their cards are going to overheat or whatever. Dude, the card does 120. You don't have to do 120. Like, like have it down like a cut cut your power down some use half the power participate yes it's not the most efficient for your particular card but you don't have to run it at full tilt if you have five s19s and it doesn't make sense drop into one still be participating but like you know make it manageable within your budget and and still partic- you know still be part of it but you know again it's it's very situational to each person if they Definitely. have hosted solutions and stuff you know uh that's a little different but like um because it's, it's deployed. Um, but you can always use, most of the time you can usually request those assets back. And again, the part of the reason for mining is you bought an asset that you can also, if it doesn't make sense in your situation, because your power, maybe is just too expensive. Maybe you take some of that, sell that particular unit, come back in, um, you know, to just coin and hold the coin, uh, in that particular situation. But you know, uh, these, these things go in like up to two and a half year cycles. Hopefully we're not going to be in a two and a half year cycle. I don't think we are. I think the inertia is a little different on this one. Uh, maybe it goes another six months and then we start to see some kind of, you know, push back up. But that's what I would yeah. tell people. And that's what I and tell people right now. That's not just what I'm telling your audience. That's what like literally I get calls <laughs> and people stop in my, my audience, office so. and yeah, <laughs> like, Hey man, like what's going on here? Like I'm not making anything anymore. And it's like, well, yeah. you know, are you, how much was your power cost? This first question. Yeah. Fifteen cents, all in. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I like your your way of thinking there. Just if you have an end goal with your miners, then shoot for that goal, no matter what. And if the mm-hmm. spot price is better than mining, then by all means, go and buy that. And over time, you're more than likely to get that uh, income back in, or that spent money back in terms of Bitcoin appreciation or whatever coin you're holding. Uh, for our for our audience, Bitcoin. Um, but we do talk mm-hmm. about other coins here and there as well, just because it's all mining all the way down. Uh, curious, curious to get mm-hmm. any tips for newbies in the mining situation right now. Uh, what I'm thinking is like, maybe you have any ideas about like renegotiating PPAs. Uh, you mentioned turning off miners. If, mm-hmm. uh, if you have any tips for home miners on how they could use uh, energy sources, just to... Yep. Any tips for a bear market? Uh, that'd be really useful, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, and I've said this a few times on the channel. We have people that do just direct consulting with us too. Um, and, and what I, and I'll, I always tell them too. I, I, I usually give all this information on my channel. So, like, if you want to for the dedicated time, no problem. We can dedicate that too. Um, but what I usually tell them is that first off, you got to reach out and see if there's a better rate that you can get. You, it does not hurt to ever make a call. I would say. Uh, uh, if you're a heavier user, when I'm saying, you know, you have eight, five, 10 rigs at your house, um, there's a chance that you could have an opportunity to getting a better, uh, commercial rate, um, that may make you have to just set up a sole proprietorship, something uh, like in the U S you could set up a sole proprietorship. You come into like a commercial rate because now you're doing it to your sole proprietorship. Um, and the, the way we've structured them is, you know, you're doing a service. At the end of the day, you've made a relationship with the Bitcoin network. You're upholding security. Your sole proprietorship, at the end of the day, you're a security provider for the Bitcoin network. It's not complicated. It's actually legal too. Like you have created a entity to uphold Bitcoin's network and you're going to pay taxes accordingly. You're going to, you're going to uh, report accordingly, but you set it up to, and the whole premise is the baseline that you are trying to improve your base cost power rate. Because you're a service provider, and that is what I've uh, what I've worked with people trying to set up that have been trying to set up stuff with that of because they're like, well, what do I set it up for? Like I'm just mining Bitcoin. Like why would I make an entity? And it's like, well, you're doing a service. That service contract agreement happens to be the Bitcoin code, and your payment for that service is built into its operation, right? So you are supplying security. You make a sole proprietorship because you're a Bitcoin miner. It's a legitimate business. Um, And then you go for that commercial rate. If you look in most residential areas, like in our particular area here, it's about 11 to 12 cents in some areas. 
uh, for home rate, uh, commercial rates, nine cents. And uh, the co-op area where we're at, um, it's a lot better, right? So it, the the home rate's about nine cents. It's a co-op. It's a deregulated co-op uh, setup. And the commercial rate can get all the way down to seven cents, right? And that's like direct in. That's like what your rate is. And that, that what that means is your power actual energy rate is actually about five cents. And then you got state taxes and got all the other stuff. So all in, it's seven cents. Um, and that's just like, you don't need to be a large consumer, Part of that's because of where we're at, and I'm in the I'm in Illinois. Is they have a lot of excess power when it comes to the windmill side. If you're ever south of Chicago and driving down Highway 55, headed south to Southern Illinois, you'll see seas upon seas of windmills, and you'll see about half of them off right now because they I don't want to say they overbuilt, but there was uh, there was a lot of uh, innovation since 2018 to tr- and drive to build out the renewable infrastructure. The Midwest in general is a very large infrastructure set up for this, but it's all a transmission issue. They overbuilt. They got that done quick because it's very controllable. Transmission's a lot harder. Transmission has issues because you build all those things and then you try to move it. You got to cross a lot of people's territory, tons of zoning issues. You have to agree with people like, hey, man, you in this awesome part of land that I need a line to come over. It's kind of by your house. I know it sucks, but let us pay some. And then it gets locked up in court because you don't want that or whatever. Right. So there's a lot of transmission issues, but they overbuilt because it's easy because it's in one spot, a lot of windmills. So in at least Illinois, I know Wisconsin, or we have our farm, uh, the BBT farms up in Wisconsin. Uh, our, our expansion down here is going to be in Illinois by the St. Louis area. Um, the uh, You have entities that that have a lot of excess power. So what's happened is, is their ability to sell that to a larger entity all comes down to if there's already transmission in place, you have substations, you have any of that kind of stuff. So if you're a medium to good size farm, look for other participants that maybe are also miners, join a local group, try to find out, hey, are there any other miners and maybe do a colo together and try to get a much more better rate. You can get down energy rates, uh, your energy rate prices in the Midwest. And I'll give this. North Dakota, South Dakota, here uh, in Illinois, you can get down to an energy rate around three and a half cents. Now you go to all in, you're around five and a half to six and a half cents. And that's came up. Like when we first started looking at it, it was cheaper. It was closer to three and a half, three, seven all in where you were looking at energy rates down in the twos. Uh, but you had gas go up in price. You had a couple of these other things. And then there's, there's also tiering with that. Most of those to get into that, like, four and a half to six cent range. You have to be at like five megawatts or higher, but like seven cents isn't completely out of the question in this area. And that's what I was saying is and like, there's people I know that follow the channel and I say, Hey, you can get these rates in Illinois. Uh, and they're like, wait, man, I live in Illinois. What the hell? So then they'll make a call and they're like, Oh, you know, got a commercial entity. Yeah. And then they move their rate from 14 cents to seven from a phone call. So I'd say very, 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 very first look on your bill. Who is it? And then ask them, can you send me the commercial rates? And if the commercial rates are substantial, find out if you can get uh, an entity set up to then do this in the commercial side. Um, it's going to save you in the long run a lot of money. Um, residential is a little more tricky. And then in regulated markets, it's even more tricky. Uh, and if you can't buy it from anybody else, you know, type of thing, uh, there's some issue. But like, I would just say that. And then if you have a medium to large size farm, it might make sense to move it. Um, I mean, that's what we did. And I, I did not want to move it up to Wisconsin like back in the day, like we lived down here. So it's like, but it made sense at that time. It was almost half the price at the time. So it was like, because we started scaling up, right? In 2016. So it was like, well, I guess I'm going to Wisconsin for the for the farm. <clears throat> but that's what I would say is like, if, if this is what you're doing and you're doing at any kind of scale, um, just look around, make a call. It's worth your time. Uh, and it's an actionable thing you can do. Like you're looking at the price and you're mad and you're like, Oh, what the hell? I was promised myself that I would make this. Nobody promised you anything. So you promise yourself that like, if I bought this and this calculator says it makes this, this is what I should be making. Um, and then realities, you know, things happen. Networks keep growing and, and, uh, in size. Um, and if price doesn't follow it, then yeah, you end up getting priced out at some point, but you can proactively try to re- change your situation. And that's why I say it comes back to the people. No, I've, I've seen that a, a few tweet threads on Twitter about calling up your local power agent and trying to get a better, better rate. 
there's obviously been like a big push among ASIC miners to get into home mining and it's pretty tough. Like it's, I did it myself and I've had much more downtime than uptime, uh, probably a lot on me, but I think it's, it's just part of the game. And as we go into a bear mm-hmm. market potentially and hash price crashes, you want to set yourself up for success. So that means getting your ASIC up and getting your power cost down. Yeah. I mean, maintenance and stuff. We don't, I mean, I tried to cover it a, a little bit on the channel. We've had a couple of things, but especially with like GPU maintenance, um, ASIC maintenance, a little different. I mean, we have, uh, like I said, a hundred deployed up, up in Wisconsin and we've had two out of those hundred have some issues uh, that we've had. We had a board go out. Um, everything was fine. Wow. And then just like day, the perfect, board decided, uh, stop, stop working. Um, and then, uh, you know, the troubleshooting side of that, we actually have a video coming out for that to show some basic troubleshooting maintenance. It really helps if you have two units, I'm not trying to upsell anybody into two units personally, but like if you have two, you can like swap things and just validate yourself. And so then when you're filling out the support request, you can say, Hey, here's what I did. I actually yeah. took this board and put it on this one and then everything worked, you know? And then like, so I know it's the board and then it just saves you all this back and forth. Um, and the same thing with like the power supplies and these things are pretty modular, you know, a six pin unplug, a few screws, slip it over to the other machine. Um, on the a six side, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, but, um, you know, being able to troubleshoot is a pretty big one. You know, we, this is one of the things that's the uh, that's not usually captured is the amount of time that an individual spends in their mining and they're not necessarily if you were to try to calculate your your compensation price of it you're not making any money but like it's a passion project like it has to be a passion project type of thing to where it's like a hobby um that happens to earn uh, a token and that token happens to have a variable rate in price at some point um start from that mindset in place uh, and then when you've done that with one, I mean, I've done this with several people, people that call us do like, like I said, like a consulting and they're like, Hey, we got, we got four investors. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to invest a, a million dollars into this. Some people come and say, I invest 10 million. I said, here, here, here you go. Invest like no more than 20,000, get a couple miners running and understand what you're about to get into. Um, I don't care how well versed you are on it. Uh, uh, just understand the maintenance, understand the the planning. And, and now we've evolved that kind of uh, solutioning for people to where I like show a smart sheet with like 150 line IMS, which shows all the things you got to consider. Home miners really don't have to worry about that, but that there is a home miner version of that. It's more like around 50 lines on an IMS, uh, like, you know, from just sound and heat transfer and all those other things. But like there's zoning, there's, there's, there's so many little nuanced things, uh, if you're going to get into this, um, uh, but you know, the, the potential upside obviously has like that kind of like gold rush kind of feel to it. Uh, especially in times when you're, when it's like all time high, right. It's like, how many can I get 20,000 of these in a box right now? Right. You know, and the reality is no, it's not that quick and easy. Um, there's actually massive amounts of, uh, nuance to it. Um, that's card uh, and it has nothing to do with the mining <laughs> It has everything to do with like, yeah, regulatory. Is there enough power in a spot? All that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, uh, start small and crawl, walk, run your way up is the best way to do it. Yeah. We'll definitely have to link to that last episode we did with you uh, and Seth from mine your biz about crawl, walk, run. That was a, a great episode. Um, yep. Michael, I want to thank you so much for your time today yeah, and for sure, your, your wisdom for bear market mining. Really helpful. It's, it's an interesting space to be in, man. What I always tell people is just like, you know, it's the whole zoom out, but take a few steps back. If you have some miners, power them down, take a break, look at them for a second, re regauge your current not operation and situation, run a couple. That way you don't have a f- total fill that you're like shutting everything down. And then just realize this cycle and it's okay. Sometimes I know it feels like you're missing out, but it's okay. If you've already made that kind of investment, you only run in a couple of them uh, to just kind of regather and then relook at, put your mind on, can I improve it in any way? Can I get better power somewhere? Can I, you know, and work that, let that be where you're putting your attention to. Um, and not so much on the price, just try to, con- it's, you know, in most situations, it's like continuous improvement, right? You're, you're recycling a few factors, uh, you know, factors here. So just, I would say have confidence in the space. It's not going anywhere and that, you know, 
we all live with this this up and down price stuff. That's gospel. Uh, again, thanks, Michael. <laughs> Appreciate it. For sure, man. <laughs>